Welcome everybody to episode 86 of Radicalized True Survives. I'm Heidi Sigmund Kuda. We are going to be bringing our friend Jason Stanley back, Professor Jason Stanley. He's the author of How Fascism Works. We are also going to be talking about his new work, The Politics of Language, and how we can reclaim the working class. Jason Stanley, we are so happy to have you back. I have been feasting off your last interview uh, a year ago uh, for about a year. I continually pluck things out of it to share with my readers and with my viewers because your work is so incredibly important. Let's start with an update on uh, how this year has been for you, what you've been working on, what you think it's important people know about in this moment. Uh, so <clears throat> I've been working on, I just came out with a book, new book, The Politics of Language in November, uh, on uh, which is helping me think through the kind of language we're seeing uh, in, in, uh, uh, from the far right, the kind of authoritarian uh, cult of the leader kind of speech. Uh, it's an academic book. And then I've been working on this new book for Simon & Schuster, Erasing History, How Fascists Rewrite the Past to Control the Future which is coming out in, uh, in September. Uh, and that's about the attack on our schools, the education system, universities, uh, the, the way that country after country around the world is rewriting its textbooks, rewriting, uh, uh, attacking university professors, trying to stack the universities and the schools with ultra-nationalist supporters of whatever autocratic leader there is. Uh, so to, I'm trying to tie the threads together, as you also often do on your program, uh, between different countries and the far right movement, the far right autocratic cult of leader movement we face in the United States today. So I'm hearing you say this, and what I am hearing is this is all how fascism works. Why does there still, in your mind, continue to be this disconnect in how our fourth estate reports this moment in time? I, for one, am uh, not encouraged at the continual normalization coverage of this race. Oh, it's it's scandalous. I mean, uh, if Trump wins, you know, it's a historical failure on the part of outlets like the New York Times who are influenced by 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 a staff that isn't totally cynical about the situation. Uh, that is just, uh, you know, many, 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 that is just, okay, it's just another election. Whiners and haters are, are saying it's different. I mean, they'll say things like, uh, oh, how can you risk another four years of Trump? Another four years of Trump? <laughs> you think Putin stays in for four years? It's absurd. Uh, like, it's not another four years of Trump. It, when you end a democratic system, it's not another four years of the leader. You know, maybe it'll be a different Trump. <laughs> uh, maybe it'll be Donald J. or or our first Jewish president, Ivanka. Uh, but, uh, but um, you know, it's, it's reporting on it like the risk is just another four years of Trump. We have um, a far right, uh, under democratically appointed Supreme Court appointed by uh, whose majority was appointed largely by uh, presidents who didn't win the popular vote. Uh, wow. They're showing them themselves to be uh, simply there to grease the wheels to end democracy. Uh, so uh, to end the rule of law. Um, so it's 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 a terrible situation and the newspapers are reporting it like a horse race, like it's just another Democratic and Republican election. And some of the, some but not all of the columnists working for uh, for these newspapers think of it exactly like that. I mean, Ross Dowdat, who I think is very smart, thinks oh, it's just another election. Uh, and so, and, and anyone who thinks otherwise is like, you know, a hysteric. Yes, uh, we, we're continually called conspiracy theorists simply because we have been focusing on the dis disinformation component. And let's go back to language for one second. Uh, Ruth ben Giat calls it the upside down. I've noticed since 2016, words are the only weapons I have to fight back. And I've noticed since then that words that I use and words like people like you use are continually plucked out of our writings, out of our mouths and repurposed 
by those who are intent on turning America into a fascist hellscape? And how can we alert people to this misuse of language, that upside down that Ruth refers to? Yeah, I, in pro how propaganda works, I call it undermining propaganda. When you use words in their reverse meaning, so you uh, you you say no, you're the ones threatening democracy, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a, which is an old one uh, a projection. Uh, but but you empty the vocabulary of its meaning by using it uh, to in, in the service of goals that that are the opposite of the word's actual meaning. So what Trump did Trump did this with the word corruption. Uh, so you know now I think the system is corrupt. Uh, Donald Trump is not wrong about that. That's one of his advantages. Uh, that. Uh, you know, <laughs> things aren't great. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, things are great. The stock market is hot, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so, uh, so, you know, you, fascism is helped greatly when, you know, people have the correct sense that the system is only working for a few. And, you know, and in those uh, conditions, you know, you get either socialism or fascism, uh, you know, depending upon how you want to correct the system. So, what you have is you have um so tr well but i'm i'm digressing from from the point of trump is aiming cor the corruption charge even though he is clearly personally corrupt uh at uh, now he's trying to aim it at biden of course and yeah. now he's trying to aim the uh threatening democracy charge at biden and what these do is they drain the words of any force or meaning Ooh. they and, and russia did this Surkov did this uh, as a political technologist, they would back opposition movements who are like official liberal opposition movements who are bound to failure. Um, the Green Party, right? Exactly. To uh, to uh, to and so people would lose all faith in democracy. Democracy became meaningless, and um, that's what Trump is very astutely doing with the vocabulary of democracy. Yes, and we, we continually um, remind people who wish to dismiss him as some clown that he's a superb propagandist. Again, those are Ruth's words, and she's absolutely right. Okay, one more from me, then Hi-Fi, you jump in. Um, Hi-Fi has been helping me investigate the shit out of Mike Johnson. We call him a mild-mannered domestic terrorist. It was very easy for us to find the 2018 uh, campaign donations from a Russian oligarch who makes munitions and the ammunition being supplied uh, for the Russian aggressors in the war in Ukraine. And he has all this, you know, all these tentacles to the Council for National Policy. My point is he's cynical. So much of what he does is to take away my rights, your rights. Uh, everything is embedded with racism and anti-anti. There's nothing... Um, there, we look at him again as a mild-mannered domestic terrorist. And you've been to Ukraine, you've taught there, you've been there recently. How do we wake people up out of this stupor so they see that if the West does not do everything we can to help Ukraine fight Russian imperialism, A, our allies can no longer trust us, and B, you know, we're not helping ourselves in any way. Yeah. It's the complete destruction of the United States as an international power. Now, as a leftist, I'm not completely opposed to that. <laughs> right. However, uh, not this way, please. <laughs> not, not, not by, I mean, you know, literally like the United States has become an international clown show. And, uh, and, you know, uh, you know, it, but unfortunately, it, it's not to the uh, to the uh, you know I you know I wish you know I hope we're leaders of liberal democracy in uh, by our example, and I hope we we help uh, democratic regimes against autocracy and not invade countries in the name of democracy when it's really uh, uh, fallacious. But Ukraine's a very clear case. It's an extremely clear case, and it looks like there is, uh, from what one hears, it appears to be there are there's Russian funding flooding into the United States, literally, uh, you know, uh, you know, traitorous uh, politicians undermining our 
undermining our standard, our standing internationally. It would be one thing if they were politicians saying, we're going to undermine the United States' position internationally because we disagree with empire. <laughs> but yeah. that's not, the, it's, that's not it's, happening. It's, uh, undermining propaganda. It's again, you know, robbing words of meaning. They're supposedly doing it, uh, you know, to to prop the United States as standing up. This is standing in the world. This this is uh, internet. You know, if you cared about uh, about the, you know which countries have a say in international affairs, and of course, the United States has a decidedly mixed record in world affairs. Uh, but if you cared about the United States' standing, you know, we're on every count, uh, what this far right program is doing is undermining the United States, threatening our economic system by repeated government uh, government shutdowns, which means that uh, which means that the interest on our loan is go on our loans goes up. There are a lot more risky loans, so that means we all pay more. Uh, eventually, it may threaten the dollar as the world's uh, 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 ba uh, currency, uh, you know, this is what's happening domestically. They're literally undermining faith in the United States economically po and politically and, and, and politically internet domestically and internationally. It is literally a, an attack on the United States. Now, you know, uh, I've, if you want that, go ahead, but label it correctly. Uh, so, uh, so you know, it's it's uh, it it's a very effective attempt to destroy our economic system. Uh, you know, by you know making it uh, create domestic unrest um, and destroy our standing internationally. Uh, I'm not you know making claims about whether that's good or bad. I'm just stating a fact. And so, uh, so. Uh, you know, if, if you want, you, you couldn't have, you you couldn't, uh, you know, the enemies of the United States couldn't have wanted anything more than Mike Johnson and Donald Trump. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's astounding. Ukraine is fighting, uh, you know, Ukraine is fighting against a clearly fascist empire that, is being that Mike Johnson is handing is threatening to to um, and threat threatening to just completely needlessly kowtow to, so to hand them the country of Ukraine. Ukrainian soldiers are willing to fight and die en masse to fight Russia. They just need weapons. Um, they're not asking for anyone to fight for them. Uh, so they've been fighting for two years, but. You know, Mike Johnson single-handedly will uh, be responsible for, uh, might be responsible for the murder of hundreds of thousands of people, for the complete destruction of Ukrainian culture and language, torture camps, mass rape. Mass we know what Russia does when it invades a city, when it attacks a city. You want to see that happen to Kiev? Uh, so so uh, single-handedly responsible for that much bloodshed and destruction. Um, it's a lot to weigh on his conscience, and I suspect he doesn't have one. It appears he does not. He's been doing this work for a very long time, and that is why um, we. I'm so grateful that you helped answer that question. We keep trying to wake people up to the stakes. High five. Uh, you talked about billions of dollars flowing into the United States to wage war upon the United States from inside the United States. Uh, I would argue that there currently seems to be an international consortium of billionaires. I mean, look at look at the United States. We have Elon Musk. We have Peter Thiel. We have Harlan Crow buying our Supreme Court uh, in Germany. They have Dahmermuth buying the CDU. Schultz is not sending tourist missiles to the Ukraine. We see Russian billionaires everywhere. We see them in London, Grad. Um, it feels to me, and perhaps I'm incorrect at this, but it feels to me like there is a certain amount of class conflict occurring. Billionaires are funding these operations, be they media operations, psychological operations like Project Veritas, uh, even training. We know that the billionaire uh, Eric Prince is training Project Veritas people. Um, we see these operations across our country, across the globe. 
Uh, we see the farmers in Poland dumping Ukrainian grain, except they're all flying Russian flags and have signs in Russian. Um, is this a class war? Uh, uh, well, fascism is sometimes described from <clears throat> in, in certain political traditions as oligarchical finance capital backed nationalism to trick the working class. And that's classically what we're seeing. We're seeing the billionaire class fund fascism uh, using homophobia, uh, racism, patriarchy to create what one headline called the rainbow coalition of hate. So it's going to be a multicultural, multiracial movement that is uh, that where you know you have white supremacists, anti-Semites, sexists, uh, homophobes. Uh, you know you're going to have you're going to draw in uh, the Christian the Christian right uh, because they're drawn in by the anti-LGBT stuff and the anti-abortion uh, line. Uh, this is familiar from the past. Plenty of people who wouldn't self-describe as fascists. Plenty of people who wouldn't describe themselves as white supremacists. They're anti-trans. They're not white supremacists. <laughs> they're uh, they're uh, <clears throat> uh, so they're the foot soldiers of hate. The foot soldiers of hate, and each group has its own target that they hate: Muslims, immigrants. Uh, you know, so we're gonna have uh, black uh, Trump supporters who don't like immigrants or Muslims or LGBT. We're gonna have white Trump supporters who don't, who like his uh, macho posturing uh, and domination of black Americans. We're going to have a lot of men who like, you know, who like to see, you know, someone who's been accused multiple times of sexual assault and gets away with it. Someone who uh, we're going to have religious conservatives who like the stacking of the Supreme Court with far right uh, justices who seek to uh, ever constrain women's rights. So, uh, so this is this is the situation, and it's all funded by billionaires who want to get rid of regulations, so they can uh, so they can plunder the earth and survive climate change in their giant bunkers in Hawaii. I keep on thinking about how much I learned from you about America's original sin, in the sense that we have not worked out our racial issues. We've also not worked out our misogyny issues. And I bring this up because I've been doing a deep dive into the 2016 election attack. And because we don't deal with our vulnerabilities, we are continually getting wedged apart and weakened by those who wish to destroy our, you know, uh, imperfect democracy. How, um, how can we wake people up to the fact that if we don't heal, and work our shit out. We really won't have anything left resembling a democracy. It's it's us who have to deal with our own shit. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I mean, I think Biden tried to do that, but it's kind of been working in slow motion. Uh, you know, you have to make uh, the Trump the Trump base. You know, I I saw an interview with a you a top UFC fighter who was like. I represent the Trump guy. I'm the working class white Trump supporter. At the social identity that he has created among the white working class, it, it's it's you know it's literally your identification as a tough tough guy white working class person is now a Trump supporter. So yeah. that is really difficult in that situation because it is beyond rationality. Right. Uh, it right. means that that. It's about humiliating the liberal elites, you know, getting women back in their place, you know, uh, you know, you, uh, but it's about social identity. You know, you're a wimp unless you're a Trump supporter. And so uh, so somehow we have to convey the message that uh, that the actual cowards and wimps are the ones who line up behind uh, uh, this uh, this billionaire wannabe fascist di dictator. Wow. Yeah. And a rapist and a fraud. All those things. So so that's really, really important. We interviewed a two-time Trump supporter who um, called it, uh, he felt he was in a cult. 
and he was kept in a heightened state of fear, desperation, and panic. And he managed to get out because somehow he, it was actually Ron DeSantis that got him out when he saw Ron DeSantis not protecting kids from COVID. That's when he first looked around, changed his infosphere, saw that there was a military, uh, very military organized operation in January 6th and managed to get out. Uh, so for the midterms 18 months or so ago, when I interviewed you, you said what we need to do in the face of fascism is that we have to uh, have a broad coalition and we have to vote, vote, vote. That might be the last election that matters. And here we are, you know, lurching toward November. Um, what can you tell us? What do we need to do? Well, Trump is very cleverly targeting the anti-democracy, trying to uh, deflate the vocabulary of democracy. Uh, <clears throat> we... I, I wish we could get to the skeptics and doubters in the major media, but they are sealed off uh, from from the rest of us. I mean, some of them I know, and they're friends of mine, but they literally, you know, oh, there's no issue. Um, you know, it's just hysteria that's still going on. Uh, the uh, the uh, you know, and they'll be doing that, you know, until you know they're they're until you know uh, until I mean, they'll just be doing it forever because they're committed to it. So what do we do? Unfortunately, I'm, I mean, we have to broadcast the stakes of these elections. I think getting women out to vote, there's very, it's a very clearly going to go after IVF fertility. It was an 8-1 vote in the Alabama Supreme Court by all these far-right anti-democratic appointees. The, the, Trump admin, the, the Trump cult has taken over much of the legal system. So that's how things work then you know at some point we're going to get legal targeting of of opponents uh probably through the tax system or something like that if they're going to continue to imitate victor orban uh i don't think we'll get a putin style assassinating political opponents here i don't think that's i think it'll be a soft thing like hungary where you know uh anti-trump business people will have to sell their businesses We'll, we'll get pressure on them. I mean, we have a complicated country to bring under autocracy. So, uh, but Russia does too. <laughs> so, okay. so, but, uh, but I think, you know, we have a more unruly uh, federalist system. So, uh, so that will provide some protections. But I think, you know, emphasizing the democracy message helped in the midterms. Now it appears no one, Americans are already totally okay with the person who uh, loses the popular vote becoming president. I mean, the Republicans, Republican presidents, that's just what they do. They lose the popular vote. Uh, wow. So, and nobody seems to mind. So I, I'm worried the democracy message won't have the force uh, of, you know, we have the Christian Taliban coming uh, because that they, they're one of Trump's support uh, support mechanisms, and it's part of the great replacement theory ideology. You need more babies. You need more white babies. You know, otherwise you're going to get immigration. We need, you know, population decline is an enormous threat. You know, even though you could just bring in immigrants, and it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be no population decline. But it's that's great replacement theory. People talking about the dangers of population uh, uh, decline I mean meaningless it's senseless given the number of people who would live in the united states so uh so it's unchristian Christ christianity is all about being a universal religion it's not nationalist so christianity doesn't tell you you need more white babies uh so 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 we need to talk about i think a politically powerful message is the super harsh uh train that's coming down the tracks towards women's rights uh, we can see we already have something like what's happening, uh, what, what has long happened in Russia, uh, where uh, where you have LGBT flight. So I think you so you have LGBT flight from multiple states in the South. Yeah. Uh, that's a terrible warning. Now, yeah. uh, LGBT uh, P, uh, Americans are an easy internal enemy because they're 10% uh, of the population. An even better internal enemy are tran transgender Americans because they're a tiny slice of the population. So, uh, so you know, I'm not sure how much the culture war thing is gonna help Republicans. Uh, I think 
you're not going to be the de but the Democratic Party needs to fight that. I think it's looking like, although I'm not an expert, it's looking like the basis for that should be uh, women's rights because yeah. they're coming, you know, the the patriarchal the patriarchy is taking over the racism. Though they are of course linked, you can't really dis disentangle patriarchy and racism because after all. You know, underlying racism is a panic about black men supposedly mm -hmm. raping white women. Mm -hmm. Patriarchal because this whole protect our white women, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is, is is patriarchy. Ida B. Wells points this out right. in, in the 1890s. So, wow. so, but patriarchy is the, the the Republican Party. I think it's almost like their number one besides destroying the United States from inside and out, our economic system, or racking us up with debt so that uh so that we can't pay destroying all regulations so the billionaire class can do whatever the hell they want uh because they've got bunkers in hawaii or whatever so uh uh going after w controlling women that's what's that's what's gathering them a, a big base and so the democratic party has to be very clear that the republican party is turning to you know patriarchy is a mainstay thing my 13 year old talks about how his friends are being exposed to Andrew Tate and all these Manosphere YouTube videos. Uh, and so it's patriarchy, it's women's rights. Women have to be out there um, because, you know, uh, uh, the, the Republican base wants, a significant portion of the Republican base wants to be them to be having babies at home. Well, I, I know our time is up. Hi-Fi has one more. Let's do, can we do a lightning round? You wrote something brilliant about fascism's legal stage uh, a couple of years ago. We're living it. Our podcast partner, Jim Stewartson, being sued by Mike Flynn. Um, and I just would like you to, and, and we're fighting. He's, you know, we've got 10 out of the 14 charges already tossed out. But But why is this a thing as the fascist creep approaches why well, why why is why is this little podcast you know partner uh getting the ire of someone like flynn uh, uh to send a message uh to send a message the uh the united states laws allow you to, to tie someone up in court indefinitely so uh, bankrupt them with legal fees so uh you know it's it's sending a message against political dissent. This is what I was talking about with the Victor Orban uh, strategies. Victor Orban uses the courts to tie uh, uh, to tie anyone who's not his supporters. You know, it's all corruption, ultimately. It's all about getting the money into the hands of the billionaire class, getting the money into the hands of the oligarch and his, fr of the autocrat and his friends. And so, you know, you, you set an example using the courts. And unfortunately, uh, you know, our court, our laws allow anyone to sue anyone for anything. Thank you very much. High five. So if I am correct, and this is class war occurring, uh, you know, we have been sounding the alarm for the working class. We know that the fascist side has a bunch of billionaires financing them. I know that there are billionaires out there who are sitting on the sidelines because they don't think this affects them. What would you say to those billionaires who will eventually be on the target list once the fascists take sure. over? But what would you say to them to get them off their asses and start taking action? Um, I would say that a loyalist, uh, a system where uh, the... Uh, loy those loyal to the autocratic dictator get all the gains of the society. And that's not capitalism. Uh, that's just, I mean, do they want to see Trump supporters stacking the Commerce Department? Um, this is not good for business. Uh, you know, you select the wealthy people that you want in this, in this kind of system that we're headed into. You select the wealthy people who are the favorites, and then you use the courts to funnel money to them. So uh, I, again, I don't think that we're going to get a Russia style violent, you know, they're not, I don't think they're going to be imprisoning. I think they're going to be doing what they did to you and tie people up in courts and use the 
the legal system uh, to target opponents, uh, but not in the brutal ways that Russia does, but in the more in the ways that our bond does. Uh, so the media, we're seeing already the media being taken over by Clear Channel, by Sinclair Broadcasting, local radio, local TV news. Um, so this is how it works. Um, you, we're going to see uh, more more local TV being forced being forced to sell to uh, to these giant far right media conglomerates, uh, and <clears throat> who will who will continually send the same messages uh, in, uh, at listeners. And even if you're skeptical of those messages, it takes a toll. It has a psychological effect. That's why people pay advertisers. Final word. I feel like we have been showing at the polls from Kansas to Ohio that people do not want to take women's health care rights away. And yet I feel that everybody acts so surprised when we see these criminals do criminal things. And we, I have this uh, sense that people are obeying in advance and like Timothy Snyder has taught us not to do. How do we just wake people up? Just one more zinger from you. I like the metaphor of the train. Is there anything else that we can plant a seed in as we fight back uh, with our own narrative warfare? Our democracy is imperfect. We must admit that the spoils go too often to uh, to the wealthiest among us, who are themselves the one who are, ones who are undermining democracy. Uh, and we have to reclaim the working class by pointing out that uh, the policies that they're backing it will result in the people that many of the people they don't like uh, being uh, humiliated, harmed. But it's the billionaire class behind this, and yes. uh, and you know it's cultural elites being targeted, like Yale professors, and you know maybe we certainly deserve some of that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> behind them are the business elite. Uh, behind these attacks are the business elite and the working class to 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 treat Elon Musk as a hero of the working class. Uh, that hypocrisy. Uh, must be uh, uncovered and and explained. Like, why is someone with hundreds of billions of dollars your representative? Oh, my gosh. Reclaiming the working class. I absolutely love that. Uh, last thing, want to tell our audience the liberation you feel being off the tweeters? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I just wasn't going to be on a platform that Musk owns. So, uh, so it was an easy decision. Uh, uh, Twitter is a mechanism for uh, for uh, mass attacks. Uh, there's again this this uh, inversion and like, oh, it's the leftists who are doing the mass attacks. It's the woke people. And no doubt there's some of that and that's problematic and I don't denounce that. Uh, but uh, Twitter is, you know, if you're, they'll, you know, when I was on Twitter, some far right Trump supporter be it Jack Posobiec or some or someone else or someone masking themselves as a uh, as some kind of centrist would target me, and then thousands of thousands of of you know people would be tweeting about uh, about me, and it was psychologically difficult when I was on Twitter. Now I never look at Twitter. Uh, I don't care what happens on Twitter. Um, it's no longer a weapon uh, uh, against me because. You know, I don't open Twitter, um, so so I don't even have any means. I'm grateful to Musk for making it <laughs> that you have to <laughs> Twitter in order to see Twitter. Um, so so uh, so it it opens me. It it allows me. I I can also. Uh, I walked into some of those. I admit I walked into some of those uh, those attacks uh, by tweeting random thoughts thoughts when I was stressed out or too tired or what most often it was in the middle of attacks so yeah. in the middle of the tax i tweet something snarky uh or or ironic and then it would be screenshot and then you know so that's how those attacks work they make you feel panicked and then you know you're you you're forced into a mistake now i rely on my tv appearances my carefully thought out editorials and my books uh to do the, that work, then I'm not writing uh, when I'm under attack. Um, and so 
Twitter has transformed from uh, a platform of free inqu inquiry to a weapon and a uh, powerful weapon. Uh, and so uh, I call it a $44 billion PSYOP cannon. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's uh, when you're under attack, you're going to make mistakes, and that and the mistakes are then going to be broadcast. Uh, and if you're if you're writing things when you're tired, when you've done, when I wake up at five forty five in the morning to make breakfast and lunch for my kids and drive them to school, um, I'm tired, and I write sometimes late into the night. I'm tired sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so now when I write an op ed, when I do a TV appearance, especially when I write a book that I spend a year on or two years or three years. Uh, it's thought out, and uh, and so there's not, and then you know, not looking at Twitter. Uh, also, it it um, hurt my brain. Uh, I'm a fast reader, uh, and I found that Twitter cut down on my ability to speed read. Um, wow! So so it has this effect on your uh, actual uh, attention. Uh, and your ability, cognitive ability, yeah. your cognitive ability. So, uh, so I've been able to write much more off Twitter. Uh, I finished the scholarly book I've been working on for eight years, The Politics of Language with David wow. Bieber, a linguist. And I wrote a new book from scratch, um, all, you know, largely because I got not largely, but a significant, uh, what enabled me to do things like go to Yale, the Yale's library and get out volume after volume yes. of, Nazi, uh, of Nazi teacher union uh, wow. collections and read through them wow. uh, in German is that I wasn't checking Twitter every five minutes. I could do the yeah. deep scholarly dive that is required for genuine inquiry. Um, so, wow. uh, so get off Twitter. <laughs> Thank you for not smoking Twitter. I love that. I will I will admit though I miss your World Cup coverage. <laughs> Nothing brought me greater joy than your sports coverage, truly. <laughs> um, Jason Stanley, thank you so much. We're so grateful that you spent this time with us today and we wish you a beautiful day and we'll keep doing the work. I know you'll keep doing the work and uh, that's speaking, all we can do. I'm speaking at the Ukrainian Museum in New York City tonight. Oh, so. I wish I was there. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you kindly. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you.